So good evening and thank you for attending our discussion of the SPP uh, student survey we conducted this semester. The class devoted a lot of time to this project in addition to uh, problem sets and exams and reading and class participation. Um, and uh, it, I think it turned out to be a really great project. So the initial objective of doing this survey was to give the class a hands-on exercise so that they could have the real experience of designing, administrating, and analyzing data from a survey. So that was the primary objective of doing the survey. We, con we contacted student services then here at SPP about doing the survey of SPP students and thus one of our other primary object objectives is to um, help the Office of Student Services and the Dean's Office in learning about student preferences about course selection and course schedule so that they can make decisions um, about that in the future. This is the overview of the sampling uh, process, uh, sorry, of the survey process that we followed and it is gonna be the order uh, in which we talk about the survey. Um, tonight we divided the survey process into eight main tasks and each step you see here roughly corresponded to a chapter in our book or to uh, the readings that we had for that week. Each student was assigned to a task, so there were between one and four students assigned to each task. And it was really a real life exercise because if you didn't finish the first step, then the second step couldn't proceed. And if the second step didn't finish, then the third step. step. So it was really um, not only an uh, exercise in a survey, but also in um, project management, and we finished. Right? So we have our final task was completed and handed in tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to the speakers now for each of them to talk about their tasks, to briefly describe it, and to tell us what they found. We'll start with sampling. Hello, and welcome to our survey methodology sampling. Our group was assigned the task of creating a sampling strategy that was representative of the students at the George Mason University School of Public Policy. The target population was all SPP students enrolled in the spring of listing of email addresses of these students. This list was estimated by the Office of Student Services to represent approximately 95% of all SPP students. This sampling frame of 952 email addresses indicated in which degree or certificate program the student was enrolled. We believed that it was relevant to this survey that each program be proportionally represented in the sample. The sampling frame was divided into nine strata that represented each of the master degree programs, the PhD program, certificate programs combined into a single stratum, and a stratum of non-degree students. The sample size was calculated to obtain estimates for plus or minus a 4% margin of error at the 95% confidence level. The sample size was adjusted with a finite population correction based on the size of the target population and it was determined that the sample should include 378 elements. Using systematic selection, every third element was drawn based on a random generated number and with a circular selection process until the 378 elements were chosen. The final results of the sample selection and a comparison to the distribution of elements of the target population are shown on this slide. Okay, great. Now we're gonna have a speaker from our uh, initial questionnaire design. Okay. I'm gonna talk about our initial questionnaire design. So this was, um, unless we have a speaker from that group? No, okay. So um, there was a set of students assigned to design the uh, questionnaire, which, was, which is the set of questions that get asked of the sample. And so the first step was to review the goals of the project. And so meeting with the client to review what the objective was of the survey, the types of information um, that needed to be collected, and so on. The group then divided the survey into topic areas, um, uh, course schedule, course content, demographics, things like that. And so each of the t uh, task members sort of decided to draft questions in each of those topics. These questions were reviewed with the clients for sort of wording and whether they were getting at the right uh, types of content. When the questions were drafted, we talked about the fact that it was important to draft um, a lot of closed-ended questions. These are questions where respondents are forced to choose from among a set of answers. And the reason for doing that is it makes the data easier to analyze at the end of the day. It, um, uh, you don't have to code uh, handwritten answers. 
In addition, this group uh, wrote up some similar questions such that the respondents were answering the same kind of question twice to verify responses on certain elements. And then there were some questions for which having an open-ended option, that is a place where respondents could provide a written response uh, a little bit lengthier to clarify or to uh, expand on some of the questions. Um, things related to um, electives, desired electives, different kinds of course uh, scheduling uh, and those sorts of topics. The initial questionnaire design then was passed on to the um, second uh, questionnaire design group that made further refinements to it. We were in the final questionnaire group and we basically had a three-step process to do it. We received the original questionnaire, that was the first step, and then we conducted focus groups and interviews with certain individuals to really analyze how well the questions were written and to see if we could make some changes to make them better. Once we had revised the questionnaire, the last step was uploading it to Qualtrics, which is an online survey program. And it was very easy to do that. It really has a step-by-step -step instruction, so it was very easy to move through. And this is what it looks like. So basically what we did was we received the questionnaire originally, and I conducted personally a focus group of about 20 people. And I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> We all conducted focus groups, but we had a, a focus group of about 20 people, and what we did was ask questions that said, you know, read this question out loud. Is it confusing? Does it make sense? And if you were taking this survey and you read this first question, would you take the rest of the survey or would you just give up because it's too complicated? Questions like that. So we worked our way through the uh, questionnaire itself, and we refined it, we made it more consistent. Some of the questions were a little bit different and then it would go back to a certain style. For example, we'd have multiple choice that had the option of I don't know, and then later in the survey we'd have multiple choice without that option. So we made it all consistent by going through the Qualtrics program. And um, then we just uploaded it and that was it. We passed on to the next group. Thank you. Hi, so our group was tasked with calculating the response rate and also um, following up on the non-respondents after the survey was sent out. So after the survey was drafted, the professor sent out the survey to the email addresses that we had and we waited one week to calculate an initial response rate. And we used response rate too so we could include um, partial respondents in the response rate. And I'll talk a little bit about how we determined that um, in a few minutes. So after a week after we sent out the initial survey, we had 102 respondents, and the total sample size was 378. So the initial response rate we calculated was 27%. We then drafted a follow-up email that basically we had to send out to the entire um, group. So we said, thank you for responding. If you've responded, if you haven't responded, please you know, or put in your response so that you can have your views aired and, and just try to make it enticing for them to respond back. So, because our email was so enticing, we got an additional 60 respondents. So, after another week, um, we calculated that and we had 162 respondents and that response rate was 43%. We then calculated the response rate for each of the individual programs and we found that the highest response rate was with the MPP program, which was the highest um, sample size that we had as well. So, that uh, response rate was 52% for the MPP program. And the lowest response rate was for the non-degree students. We only had one response um, for that, so you can imagine it's difficult to extrapolate any preferences or information out of one respondent. Um, so that response rate was 8%. So how we calculated the partial respondents, we had 159 respondents that actually finished the survey, meaning they reached the end and uh, answered the final question of the survey. We then had three partial respondents, which were respondents that answered over seven questions, but they didn't quite finish the survey. And then we then had two um, people that didn't answer any questions. Um, so we didn't include those as partial respondents. They were, I'm guessing, thrown out by the subsequent group. Um, so right, in total we had 162 respondents. So it was, it was a little bit, less complicated for us because everyone was eligible um, to calculate the response rate, meaning that everyone we sent the email out to was 
eligible um, to air their preferences as a student in the MPP program. And I know the waiting group is probably going to talk about this later, but it was, it's also difficult to calculate non-response bias based on the limited information that you have. I'm guessing that they provided some information on um, the response rates for each particular program, but we don't have sort of demographics about each uh, program um, that we could determine, you know, what those non-respondents were. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next group. Great.